No one at at t talks publicly about what this stuff is. It's not documented anywhere. Even getting someone from at t to answer the most basic questions about this was clearly not something they wanted to do. They certainly wanted to say as little as possible. SIM cards are those little pieces of plastic that you put in your phone that allow you to have cell service. They may seem just like a piece of plastic, but a lot of people don't realize that they can and do send messages all on their own. It's completely silent and it actually leaves no trace on your phone that anything has occurred. So we're going to be diving into what's called proactive SIMs in this episode. And on the show today, I have David Allen Burgess here to explain how it all works. David has worked in telecom since 1998 in both both signals intelligence and commercial equipment, and he does expert work in legal cases as well. Welcome to the show, David. Thank you. Thank you very much. So let's dive into this. I read an article that you wrote where you talked about this from the perspective of legal cases. You said that every once in a while, an attorney is going to request cell phone activity records from mobile operators, and then these random numbers show up in message history, and people get really confused and say, well, I didn't, I didn't make this. So talk me through this case that you mentioned. What did you find? In this particular case, uh, there was a car accident, and what we get is called an activity record. It's, it's produced by a mobile operator, in this case, AT&T, under a subpoena. Right around the time of the car accident, like literally within seconds of, of the accident, um, the activity records from AT&T showed that the cell phone had sent a text message to a particular strange-looking number. In this case, the number was 11113400002. Immediately, one of the parties in the lawsuit started saying, ah, this is distracted driving. Uh, the driver was playing with the phone. This is why there was an accident. So you did some testing and you found out that the SIM was sending messages all on its own without the knowledge of the phone owner. Correct. So a typical smartphone actually has three computers in it. It has the, the application processor, which is the part that uh, most people think of as their cell phone. It's, it's usually running Android or iOS, and that's the part that people interact with. And then below that, there's something called the baseband processor that manages the telecommunications functions of the phone. And you know, it, it actually makes telephone calls and connects to your mobile operator for cellular data sessions. And then below that, there's the SIM, which is actually a full computer system. It's a little hard to believe that little piece of plastic. It's as much power as you would have found in a desktop computer maybe 20 years ago. It's got its own operating system. It's got its own, its own file system. The way these are arranged, the, the application processor communicates with the baseband processor. And the SIM communicates with the baseband processor. And the baseband processor communicates with the cellular network. And this, this means that there can be communication going on between the baseband processor and the SIM that's not visible to, to the application processor. So, so iOS or Android doesn't know what the SIM and the baseband processor are doing uh, between each other. They, 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 it doesn't see that protocol. You can think of a smartphone really from, from an evolutionary standpoint. In one evolutionary branch, we had uh, cell phones, which today we would call feature phones that were kind of dumb. And what's in a feature phone is a baseband processor and a SIM. And in a feature phone, the only real general purpose programmable computer in the phone is the SIM. In the early days of, of cell phones, before smartphones, when mobile operators wanted to put special applications on a phone for things like mobile banking, for example, uh, these applications would be programmed into the SIM, and the SIM needed to have enough power and, and enough access to the baseband processor to actually run those types of applications, like a, you know, cellular account management. Um, like I said, I said mobile banking, that's a, that's a big one. And, and just before the iPhone age, um, also very simple web browsers. So that's one branch of evolution with, with the feature phones. The other branch of evolution was, was uh, something called PDAs, which were the first sort of pocket computers, um, like Handspring Visor was a big entry in this market early on. What happened with the iPhone, sort of the beginning of the, beginning of the, of, of the, of the real smartphone, they took the functionality of the PDA and combined it with, with, with phone. And 
from the point of view of, of the telecommunications network, what a smartphone is, it's still just a sort of basic feature phone with this really fancy user interface on it, uh, which would be the application processor. So from the point of view of a typical smartphone user, they say, oh, it's an Android or an iOS phone. And they mostly see Android and iOS, and that's what they interact with. From the point of view of the telecom network, that whole Android or iOS or whatever, it's just a bolt-on accessory that's been attached to the phone. It runs a lot of dubious third-party software that should never be trusted under any conditions. That's from the point of view of the telecom network. So from the point of view of the telecom network, the baseband processor and the SIM are the phone. And everything else is just uh, an accessory that sits on top of those. What you've discovered is that there are things that can go on between the SIM and the base layer processor that the user's never aware of, that the actual iOS itself is never aware of, that these things are just going on with the phone and data is being sent out to these telecommunications companies without the user even being aware of it. Well, it's, it's not so much discovered. I mean, this stuff is all defined. And it's defined and originally defined in the GSM specifications going back 20 years. Um, it just doesn't occur to people that this is actually happening. The surprise here is that people just aren't thinking about this. They're not thinking about the fact that their SIM is reporting information back to their mobile operator that they don't know about. And they have really no way to find out about. It. That's why be, you know, such an issue in this legal case is because the attorneys involved were, were, were really surprised and kind of confused by this. It didn't, didn't occur to them that the phone would just you know, under the control of the SIM that the baseband processor would just send a text message somewhere that didn't have anything to do with anything that the user was doing. So let's dive into the information that was being sent. The IMEI of the current phone that, that the SIM is installed in, the IMEI of the previous phone that the SIM had been installed in, the MZ of the SIM, so, so that AT&T can actually identify which SIM sent the message. Something called the terminal profile, which defines the features of the current phone that, that it's installed in. Also information about the geographic area where the phone most recently registered into a cellular network. So, so the network identification and something called the location area code, which is a, a sort of geographic region within a cellular network and the cell ID. There's some other information there that even you, like by analyzing it, weren't quite able to figure out what information was actually being sent. This message payload isn't, there's no public document documentation on it. So, so the only way to, to understand what's going on is just to sort of try to try to reverse engineer the, the message content. You say in your report that you know that it was the SIM that was sending this information because it had information about the previous phone that it was installed in. It remembered it. Only the SIM would know what phone it was previously installed in. That's a, a pretty good indication that, that the SIM is producing that message. What at and does with this information we don't know that either. It makes sense that an operator would want to know this information. There's nothing sinister about them wanting to know that, but no one at at and talks publicly about what this stuff is. It's not documented anywhere. Even getting someone from at and to answer the most basic questions about this was clearly not something they wanted to do. Um, <laughs> um, but there was a lot of back and forth between the attorneys um, to, before at and finally agreed to produce a witness who, who could answer anything about this. And they they certainly wanted to say as little as possible. That sets off a lot of alarm bells to me because we know that at and in the past, you've had revelations where whistleblowers have found out all of your calls are being diverted to the NSA and there's a room at at and that is you know, collecting this data and they don't have a great track record when it comes to user privacy and when it comes to letting users know what data is actually being collected on them. There's nothing in this message that at and couldn't collect through other means. Some technical team inside at and t uh, just wanted their own mechanism for, for acquiring this information independently of other parts of the network. One of the concerns that I would have would be that if a state operating intelligence agency in a country that, that might own its own state-owned mobile operator, they could easily use a mechanism like this for intelligence gathering purposes. Now, I haven't found anything like that, but once you understand how the mechanism works, it seems like such an easy thing to do that it would surprise me if nobody's doing it. Let's talk about the trigger for this occurring. So when these messages are sent out. In this particular case, 
the trigger mechanism was a change of something called the IMEISV. Now, IMEISV is like the serial number of the phone, the IMEI, with some extra digits appended to it that indicate the software version. The IMEISV will change if the SIM is moved to another phone. It'll see a completely different IMEI. The IMEISV will also change if the baseband processor receives a firmware update, because when the baseband processor receives a firmware update, the SV part, the software version part of the IMEISV will change. Anything that changes the IMEISV will trigger this message to be sent. And it turns out on the same day that this happened, Apple had released an iOS update that also included a baseband processor firmware update. There's the other question of what information is available to the system. The SIM doesn't have a clock of its own, but it can request the time from the baseband processor. It can request where you are geographically inside a cellular network. If the baseband processor is set up with a GPS receiver to support E911, the SIM can also request geographic location from the GPS receiver. The SIM can have access to all the telephone numbers of calls that you send and receive. The SIM can have access to sources and destination and content of text messages. The SIM can get information about activity on the phone. Is the phone idle and locked or is somebody actually using it? Is their browser active right now? I can request that information. And any of these things could be used as a trigger to send a message. And any of these things could be recorded as a message. If you wanted to, to have a simple application that sits in a SIM and, and, and tracks people's movements, and reports people's geographic locations and reports their movement to the cellular network and reports when they are and aren't using their phone and that sort of stuff. Yeah, sure, you could do it. It can't get access to, for example, the the content of your IP data sessions going through the baseband processor. It doesn't have access to that. It doesn't have access to to the speech content of your telephone calls either. It makes me consider sims to be a much larger attack vector than I had originally considered. Like, for example, I mean, you go to somewhere like Hong Kong, they have all these street vendors, they're selling all these sim cards. Is that something people should be concerned about, buying a sim from an an unknown vendor? It could potentially have been compromised in some way. Perhaps originally they're not designed to be able to interface with the application layer, but perhaps this sim has been reconfigured in order to have more access than it, it really should. Is this something people should be concerned about? I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> if you are a person who thinks that you actually might be the subject of surveillance by a nation state intelligence agency, then maybe it's something to think about. It seems like an easy enough thing to do. Uh, I'd really be surprised if nobody's trying it, but but it's. It, I do think it's the kind of thing that would be more targeted for individuals, particular individuals, not, not a mass surveillance type of tool. With SIMS, there's really very little forensic evidence that they leave behind. This would be a type of malware that would be very difficult to detect. These messages that are being sent out, where exactly are they going? The actual physical destination of that message is probably a data center somewhere on the north side of Atlanta. I think this whole world of proactive MO SMSs is very new to a lot of people, and they had no idea that this sort of thing was possible. Clearly, this is something you've been aware of for a long time. Uh, but you said that even part of this was a little bit surprising to you. It was surprising to me because working in the test networks, I'd never seen this type of behavior before. I'd seen these sorts of things in the spec, but there's, you know, frankly, there's a lot of stuff in the older specs that pe- that, that, that's in there for historical reasons that people don't actually use. So uh, I was a little surprised to actually see this. Are there people investigating what Sims are actually doing? Because it seemed very behind closed doors, unavailable to public. And I wonder how in depth we really understand Sims in general. The people who really know what's going on inside mobile operators aren't aren't talking. And most of them are probably in their non-disclosure agreements anyway. Um, And I'm not really aware out in in, in, in public, I'm not aware of, of much research like this going on at all. Um, 
you know, it is, it's entirely possible that counterintelligence groups in, inside governments may be doing projects here, but they're not going to talk publicly either. Please keep me updated. I am intrigued. It's like a, like a thriller. We're watching in real time. Like, what information is your SIM sending out <laughs> to unknown parties? We carry around SIMs in our phone and our pocket, like, all day, every day. So it's definitely should be something that we as consumers understand so we know what technology we're actually using. Uh, but I really thank you for your time. Time, and thank you for writing that interesting report that was probably illuminating for a lot of people out there. Thank you. I hope, I hope people found it interesting and uh, I hope to be able to do some more work in that direction.